um, take any questions from the audience. Um, we've got a, a Rovan mic here. And um, if you want to ask anyone a question to anyone specific on the panel, can you say who you want to talk to? Otherwise, you can just ask any question you want. Great to see positive views of Scotland. And my business is Orchid. Our byline is to help you flourish. So we work with hundreds of people on self-help, self-empowerment. However, I also think you do need to invade independence or not some of your drive, some of your ideas. I thought this with Robin and Leslie, very interesting, very pertinent, but you do need to galvanize the Scottish government. So that also needs to be done as well as empowering people individually. Um, very much related to creation, I know you said about wealth creation, etc. but we need to still in this country, and part of our work, although it's with businesses, is also with young people. We've worked with people leaving university schools, with the boys in Polmont who've come from harrowing situations, um, but working with young people through a business in Edinburgh from charities this summer, it still is pitiful. We have far more to do to provide them with self-help, the resources, the jobs that they need. So that would come very high up on any discussion of the type of Scotland that we would want. And another area I touched on was inequality in women. And so, yes, we need more power for our able women. Not just, oh, let's please Lord Davis and get some non-executive women on the boards, but right across the board. I gave evidence to the equal ops in the parliament um, fairly recently, and from what other people said as well, resources, women's talent, women's time, totally not being utilized, mainly because of, as has been mentioned, inadequate childcare. So we need to get moving on that. I have a bit of concern about everything's gonna get moving after you know, 2014 or 2018. We need actually to be doing it now. There are lots of devolved powers, there's lots that we can do individually on that and also on the whole thing of what sort of what sort of Scotland do women want our rate of domestic violence is appalling it's hardly Scotland the brave and while it is a generational thing takes longer I feel we do need to address this you know the problems of Scotland are the problems of many areas. We're a small right, country. Can, can we just <laughs> got a question at the end of this? Okay. So all I want to say is we're a small country. We can provide some of the solutions and we can be a beacon of light to the world again. Okay. That's my Thanks bit. Thank you. Thanks. Question for Robin. Uh, particularly reference to common wheel. Now, we've got a very high rate of uh, small business, and just as business failure in Scotland, but where businesses very often they're bought out by larger corporations and the wealth they generate they go, goes elsewhere. Now, I'm particularly thinking of Germany, but also the other northern European countries, they are much more successful at keeping a small and medium business sector in local hands, where the wealth these businesses generate stay in the community and these businesses can then develop can then generate capital for further investment. They tend to do better with investment than we do. What could we do with independence to improve the health of the small and medium-sized business sector and stop them being bought up by larger overseas interests? Thanks. Um, I won't go through everything. Just a very quick list of some things that we ought to be doing. First of all, we've got to start using things such as support and finance. So if we're giving generous finance terms to small businesses, part of that might be golden share and encourage them to stay. When I was talking about the importance of putting employees in boards, one of the key things about businesses which are run by employees, and it's interesting in, in the Nordic countries and particularly in Germany, the boards of big local companies have community representatives on the board. They are governed by their communities. And what happens is if you have businesses that are governed by communities or by employees, they don't sell out. It's not in their interest to take short-term benefit and, and get rid of the businesses. Um, some simple things. One thing we've got to do immediately is change the situation whereby multinationals pay substantially less tax than um, indigenous Scottish businesses because multinationals don't pay tax. We've got to crack down on tax evasion. Anyone that tells you that's difficult 
they are not telling the truth. It is very easy to end tax evasion by multinational corporations immediately. And we have got to create a cultural change. In this country, we still get a bit obsessed with that dragon's den fetishism of how much can I sell my company for. That is a measure of how successful I was. We have got to get to the situation that they have in Germany, for example, where a successful business leader considers success to be how well they leave that company for the next generation to take on. So there's cultural and practical things that we can do. There's things that we can do to do with finance, and there's things that we can do with, to, with the tax system and the monetary system as well. Um, one of the things which I think is important, and coming back to that point, is we've got to get away from the belief that there are simple answers. There is this belief, and one of the things I will be critical of the SNP is if we just say cut corporation tax, somehow that will just lead to a flourishing. There is no single act that fixes everything. We need to use packages of things. The key thing is to understand what we're trying to achieve. And if, if this is the first generation of my lifetime that's talking about how we keep Scottish businesses in Scotland, by Scotland, for Scotland, that in itself would be a big step forward. And the gentleman there, Tom Could I just say something on the. Yeah, yeah just, just a final wee thing on Germany. Where is it? Yeah, the thing about businesses. Um, one thing looking at from, from the historical context, um, after the war, the Brits were the ones who went over to Germany, to, to, thought that the, the concentration of power that had allowed Hitler to occur was something that shouldn't be allowed to happen in a new democratic country. And it was our guys who went in and created the federal structure, the very de de devolved structure that has meant Germany became an economic superpower. Um, only 18% of people in Germany bank with Deutsche Bank. So their model of banks isn't large either. And in the Nordic countries, there are Sparkassen, which are the smaller local banks. I think you're getting the theme here. Once you hand over power to one centralized authority, you're creating a recipe for the takeovers that Robin described. Now, I merely ponder that currently the Scottish government is centralizing many things. And it's true that actually in the Nordic countries, there is also a single police force. But what they have right at the bottom is very, very local police forces in their little commune. And of course, we don't have that. So, what I'm suggesting is that when it comes to trying to protect, well, even trying to protect small and medium-sized business, just allowing things to thrive, allowing the, the energy that's there to come out seems to work a lot better when you've got very locally controlled areas who, for example, do another thing. Labour, it was, who brought in the best value clause in a pernicious thing, actually, which has been very tightly interpreted by many councils. And it tends to mean that the, the, the lowest bid um, for any services will win every time. Or if you're selling assets, it has to be the highest offer. And that is currently stopping communities being able to take over assets like the Murray Libraries, for example, because best value means they need to flog it off at more than that rate. And it tends to price local businesses out of being able to supply to councils, to hospitals, all these things, which is a nonsense. Now, there's been changes in procurement that should make things a bit better by the Scottish Government, but you still have this problem. That best value presumption needs to be taken out of our public life, or at least more craftily interpreted. And I think that would happen more if those council officials were eyeballing you every day and not their corporate lawyers. And what happens when you become remote and in an ivory tower is they don't see you. They never bump into you. They don't bump into the poor. They don't bump into you. They don't bump into anybody but the professional class who run things and never meet anybody else. And that's not to knock professionals. It would be hard to do anything else the way we're constructed. But if we don't think about the structure of our lives, we'll bump on like this forever. Hi there. Uh, I've got a little bit of reading. should only take about three minutes. I've got three questions which all come under uh, the umbrella of economy, money and financial reform. I did ask similar questions to John Swinney a couple of years back at uh, Adam Smith Centre and I didn't get what I thought was a uh, gratifying answer. So here goes. Um, with an independent Scotland established, how do you see that Scottish Government 
addressing fundamental issue of issuing of money and changing monetary policy for the benefit of the majority. I'm, I'm talking specifically about the generation of money and its control. And I'd like to just quote, let me issue and control a nation's money and I care not who writes the laws. At the moment, the majority of countries and their populations are experiencing the hardship of imposed austerity measures which appear to have risen out of the banking crisis of 2008. The issuing of money is presently done through private banks, for example, Bank of England, Federal Reserve, whereby we are charged interest. Is it possible for governments of this day to take back the right to print their own money? Will the new independent Scottish government do this? If not, why not? Another quote. This House considers that the continued issue of all means of exchange, be they coin, banknotes or credit, by private firms as an interest-bearing debt against the public should cease forthwith. That sovereign power and duty of issuing money in all forms should be returned to the people and then put into circulation free of all debt and interest obligations. That was tabled as an early day motion in the Houses of Parliament. Uh, as I said earlier, I asked similar questions to John Swinney uh, at a Q&A meeting at the Adam Smith Centre more than a year ago. And unfortunately, his answer did not address any of my questions. And his reply to a further email I sent contained a copy of the, uh, Vicar, I think it was the Vicar's report on banking reform, um, which was as difficult to digest as a small print on insurance policy. Uh, my final question, will an independent Scottish government implement fully a present day form of the Glass-Steagall Act, whereby commercial high street banks are clearly and absolutely prohibited from participating in the investment banking business. And the reason I mention this is what everybody's experiencing the consequence of this austerity package. So if we move into independence, which I am up for, what's going to be the Scottish Parliament's position on that? How are they going to manage that? Or are we just going to carry on with the, the system as it stands? OK, it's late in the night for complex monetary policy. Um, first of all, the first question that you're asking, um, I, I'm not going to say what we should do, I'm going to say what will happen once we're independent. Within five years, maybe ten, an absolute outside, watching sterling, we're going to say this is not well managed. It's not well managed because we run it as a dirt cheap currency, which is really only good for financial speculation. It's difficult to explain this in a minute, so I won't. Um, but it's just to say that the way that we manage our money favours those who want to use it for speculative gain, and it's very, very bad for those who want to use it for productive building of things. It would take about five years for, us to, for that to dawn on us firmly. Um, we will not retain sterling for long once we're in. We'll get to use sterling, but we won't retain it for long. In terms of what we do for debt things, we do have to be careful. Um, fiat currency, the printing of money, is a very, very powerful thing, but if you use it willy-nilly, it does cause problems. When I was saying earlier on that we want to be able to take energy back into collective ownership because it will take 20% off the energy bills, that's because if the, if the way that the currency is managed is well regarded, borrowing costs are very low. So some of the debt write-off options and some of the things that you can do with a fiat currency harm other things that you'd want to do. So there's a straightforward playoff between these things. And on the question of austerity, anyone who pretends that austerity is an accounting or a finance issue is telling you a lie. Austerity is politics. Austerity is the pure politics of saying the way that we are going to get us out the catastrophe that we created is to pass the burden on to ordinary people and take it away from people at the top um, or from the big institutions and the big systems. That is what we've got to reverse. Uh, do you have any further questions from the audience? Gentleman down here. Thanks very much. I was very struck by Leslie's story about Tommy Riley. Um, I'm, I'll be voting yes, but I think we'd be sticking our head in the sand that if we don't at least accept the risk that Scotland's going to vote no. What can be done to stop Scotland ending up like Tommy Riley and after a no vote ending up worse off than we are now in terms of confidence and such like? Well, I, I don't think, I mean, it's hard to make that kind of parallel between a country and a man, although I suppose that's true. I don't think all the energy there is in this room, and I see all over the country, goes back in the box. I mean, something has changed about us. Robin's right. Look. I mean, what is it now? It's kind of half past nine on a Friday night. You're all largely still here, and most of you are awake. I mean, this is, 
utterly unbelievable. I mean, people are now beginning to become expert in all sorts of things that you probably never thought you even wanted to know about. And that doesn't go nowhere. So, you know, that, that energy, I hope, will begin to make people to start questioning quite a number of things right beneath your noses. Because the things, to me, what would be great, and I, I was spoke of, yes, Elgin meeting, where they were talking about libraries. And I said, you know, why don't you try, to, why don't you take up yes to libraries? I mean, why don't you just take over a library? Because what's happened is we've become infantilized by not being able to do things. I was in Linlithgow once and there was a meeting of the Chamber of Commerce and they were bemoaning the way Linlithgow High Street had dwindled. And one guy in particular was talking about a thing that maddened him, which was an underpass. And in it, there was a light bulb that was always broken. And this just drove him crazy. And in the end, I said to him, well, here's a thought. Why don't you take a light bulb and stick it in it? As in, fix it. And he looked at me for a minute like I was mad. And um, he said, but I couldn't do that. I said, listen to you. Listen to what we have become. And for a minute, he thought, well, I suppose I could. And then he thought, no, they'd probably do me for attacking council property. And you know, he could be right. But actually, personally, I don't care. I don't care anymore. It's the reason I left the BBC. It's the reason I've said I'll vote yes. Because it doesn't... You know, we have one life to live and who knows how long we're given. And I want to see change in my lifetime, by which I mean change of our capacity to work with one another and an awareness, that wonderful moment that I've been lucky to have in my life where I've seen people in communities, West Whitlawburn, Tommy Riley, Egg, particularly Egg, where you wouldn't believe, the people wouldn't believe they had the capacity to run something and their, their, their understanding of themselves was transformed. Now, that can only happen when you're able to do something practical. I'm a great believer in it. Um, and that's not a big abstract principle. It needs things to be happening in your neck of the woods. And that is happening. There are development trusts who are running everything from libraries to little wind farms to bridges to pubs. There's food cooperatives being set up everywhere. There's transition towns. All of these are people beginning to take on some of the heavy lifting. But the danger is that what will happen is people will burn out. We, we are placing on people's shoulders all sorts of voluntary responsibility. Thank God for it. Otherwise, you know, the likes of Marie, otherwise we wouldn't be here tonight. And that's great. It's a characteristic of Scotland that because our structures are wrong, our voluntary capacity is superb and will burn out. And what we should have is a society whose structures fit us. We shouldn't always be trying to fit ourselves to things that are like our great-grandfather's big coat that doesn't fit. We need things to fit our communities the way they are. And those people who are currently the valiant community activists holding the ceiling up would be the municipal councillors in any normal social democratic state. If that's not what we're going for, I'm not interested. And can I just say, um, one of my favourite quotes of all time is Oliver Wendell Holmes, a man's mind, sorry for the gender, but a man's mind once stretched by a new idea never regains its original shape. Um, this isn't going away. Um, I'm one of the few people who will stand up here and say, first of all, we are getting a no vote, uh, a yes vote, and I can explain why there's, there's not time just now, but political strategy is what I do, and I've been watching this a lot, and as soon as we get a couple of things right, talking to the Scottish Government here, we will win a yes vote, but if there was a no vote, I'm one of the few people who say it won't be five years before there's another. Um, the, what we have revealed over the course of this campaign is a fundamental problem with our society, and believe me, more and more people are understanding and hearing this. If Scotland was daft enough to vote no, which it won't be, um, it would wake up on the 19th of September feeling dirty about itself and what it just did, um, there would be a change. The last time we made that mistake, we had a massive ideological battle with Thatcher. 
there would be some massive battle that would once again galvanise Scotland. Um, and from my perspective, this is the point about Commonweal. Commonweal, you can do more with independence, but you can do a fair bit without it. And if that's what we've got, that's what we've got. We have to start to build a better Scotland either way. And if that is just to show people what they should have done and make them do it the next time, that's still what we do. We've got to do something now, and more of the same is not good enough, no matter what. Uh, any other questions from the audience? The uh, gentleman over there, Vlad. Thank you. Um, I'm a wee bit concerned that after this yes vote, after devolution, will still be governed by politicians. Uh, and given the, the scenario that uh, Leslie has drawn up for us, which indicates a completely different democratic structure from what we have now, would it not be worth our while focusing a wee bit on the Constitution? And does the panel think that that is a route whereby we can achieve that sort of structure uh, that we all seem to be aspiring to. A written constitution will be great and it will be very helpful and be a big step forward. But, um, I mean, I'm, my, my day jobber was a, a political lobbyist, which means I know that politicians are never what you wish they were, but equally, they're absolutely more than you often think they are. It's unfair just to see politicians get stuck in a system, and part of the problem is the system that they're stuck in. Um, our civil service kills a lot of what happens because it is a London-controlled civil service. We can change some of these things. However, um, I, I do share that concern. I just have never believed in the, the autopilot theory of politics. Um, and that's one of my worries about how people are talking about the Constitution. Yes, we need one. Yes, we should have one. And yes, it can make a difference. But the simple truth is, countries do not run themselves. You do not reach a point where you can legislate or create the structures and press a button and go away and have a cup of tea. Um, you have to get up every morning and work to try and achieve the things that you're talking about and accept that that's the only way you can do it. You can write constitutions and you can create systems, but it's run by people. The key thing is, let's make it us, a big collective us for a change, rather than them. That's the model that we need to move to. And this decentralising model and some changes in practice can do that. And so can the Constitution. I just don't believe that we should put too much faith in a document. We should put a lot more faith in hard work. I think there's, there's a difficulty at the moment because at the moment, if you were to take a snapshot of what people value, they do value big is beautiful. You know, the, the, there's a guy called Hofstede, Gert Hofstede, um, who's a sociologist, who did a kind of mapping of 52 nations of the world. I won't go into how he managed to do this, but through their attitudes, he classified them in different ways. This was about the 1980s. And he had um, the, the most feminine countries, were the Nordics, and Britain was about 54 on that. It was a fairly masculine country. Now, but by this, he didn't mean women run things or men run things, he meant this. He meant that in feminine countries, there was an interest in where the average was, and in masculine countries, there was an interest in where the elite was. Now, you can readily understand that Britain is quite an elite country, because after all, we're all sporting superstars, aren't we? Because we won 12 Olympic medals last year when we quite evidently ain't. Um, what we need to get to is more of an understanding that it's where the average is that you need to shift. And that's what the Nordic nations intuitively get right. We're not there yet. This thinking about decentralizing our lives is not popular. If I went out tomorrow and tried to stand on this platform for election, I'd get two votes if my mum was here. <laughs> you know, you don't miss what you've never had. And in many circumstances, what's needed in a situation is not what seems readily apparent. We have become power junkies. So we want a big man standing up there telling us it'll all be okay. We want somebody standing at the middle who says, I can outwit everyone. We are in the big man territory. We always have had that tendency. Now to go cold turkey in time to write a constitution, 
don't think it's going to happen. And if somebody wants to nail down exactly, which I think is probably a good idea, to nail down what's fair and a good structure for Scotland, it should be after a period of some fluidity where we have the chance to question, seriously question, what's I been? But that's hard. It's hard to imagine what you can't visualise. So it's going, I think the danger of, of trying to have something now is partly that it wouldn't give genuine weight to local, I'm trying all the time not to say localism because David Cameron's got his damned hands on it, but too much has been tainted in the local field for it to be automatically something people would rush towards having. So that's one worry. And the other worry is that it would be run by professionals and probably a bunch of lawyers. Now, there may be some lawyers in the room, that's not to dig them up, but it's not their ball. You know, when it comes to how things should be done, again, there are inspirational examples. The Icelanders set up a constitutional convention of people who nominated themselves and were voted for online. And there was all sorts of people in there, including a couple of lawyers. I'd like to think we could move there, but equally, we are so hung up with status, we won't do that either. So if you want a constitution right now, I can tell you what you'll get. It's outside the door. It's what we've got. And what we've got isn't fit for purpose. So let's consider, this is not nothing to consider a new idea. What we do, we're grabby. Because we think the chance may never arrive again, we try to grab opportunities quickly and think, what can we get tomorrow? What can we do with this? How can we make it happen? We need to consider these changes this time because grabbing has not got us the best answer. We need to really sort of start considering what a better society would look like. So soon, but not now, I'd say. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, just to make this absolutely clear, I am voting for independence and I will wrestle anybody to the ground uh, who isn't. Uh, but I have a question for the communications guy because I'm re extremely worried about Salmon's relationship with Rupert Murdoch. So what can you tell me to reassure me ab about that? That relationship is far too cosy. No, I'm sorry, that won't do. That won't do, there's too much at stake, I'm very sorry. The second question that I'd like to ask is about our relationship, our potential relationship to uh, the war machines of America and, and Britain. What will our relationship be to America and to Britain? Ross, do you want to give a quick answer to? <laughs> I know. Um, we, we, don't right, okay, let's, let's we don't have orders. We don't have orders. We can answer. We can not answer. And that, and that would just be the thing. Um, I think that the SNP government has done a lot of wonderful things. I think it was. I, I think there's a couple of unfortunate things. I think the the, the 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 sense of the Murdoch stuff was unfortunate and not helpful. Partially, some of the Trump stuff as well. Um, this is the nature of politics. These people spend lots and lots and lots and lots of money trying to make politicians beholden to them, we need to address that. And we shouldn't have people like, I mean, let's be clear about this, there's one way we can make sure that no Murdoch exists, and that's have the capacity to set our own press ownership rules. Um, so my, my response to that is, um, let's not bash Salmon, let's bash Murdoch and make sure there isn't somebody there who can do that um, again. And in terms of the American war machine, the key thing to be is not part of Britain. That, that's the number one thing that you have to address if you want to get rid of being the, the, the American defence establishment. We've got a paper coming out in a week or two, and it's not actually about defence, but it's about this idea of international relationships. This is another British thing. We don't really know what goes on. We still assume that everything is being operated on the power of large multilateral, multinational negotiations. What we're not really aware of is it's actually broken down. The WTO, the capacity to manage the world behind closed doors, by the US ended, and the group who ended it were a collection of Latin American states who got themselves together under the name Mercosur and said, no, enough. We're not continuing like this. We're not going to allow US commercial interests to dictate international trade rules. One of the, th the, the aftermath of that is the international relationships are largely, they've gone back to bilateral negotiation. 
which is actually a good thing, it's a positive thing if we can start to do this. So one of the things that I would say is not only um, get, out, or get away from the, 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 the chinless wonders of, of Whitehall, who believe fundamentally that the US is our future, um, so get away from them, and then start to look for other partners. What could we do working with the Nordic countries? What could we do working with Mercosur? What could we do working with some emerging economies in, in Africa? What could we do to change global attitudes through creating our own relationships and not just trotting along behind big brothers, which is what we've been doing for our entire existence? Right on Loch Lomond, where me and my two loves went many happy days on the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond. Two sadly parted in yon shady glen on the steep, steep sides of Ben Lomond, where broken heart knows no second spring. We must be while we're parting. You'll take the high road and I'll take the low road, and I'll be in Scotland for you, where me and my true love will never meet again on the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond. You'll take the high road and I'll take the low road. Scotland before you, where me and my true love will never meet again on the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond.